everyone, and welcome to another episode of Theater Makers Interviews. This week, uh, my guest is Gina Vitucci, actress, director, singer extraordinaire. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm very good. So we will start at the very beginning. It's what a was, very good place. You are the first person to do it. <laughs> In 11 episodes, you're the first person to do that. And I've been waiting for someone. Um, <laughs> what was your very first theatrical experience? Uh, show, show that I was involved in or like where theater and I had where you and theater met. first met um, theater and I first met when the community theater a block away from my house in Whiting Indiana um, the Marion Theater Guild just mm -hmm. still going strong um, was doing Tea House of the August Moon okay. and my brother and my cousin who was like my sister were both cast in it my mom was choreographing or something and I was too young to be in it and I was devastated. And I went to every rehearsal. Um, I, had, I had to get a costume. They needed to get me a costume. Um, and I just wanted so badly to be involved. I will never forget not being able to be involved. So the very next year I, I did the, sh the musical the next year there, but I was like six. And it was when I just was introduced to this world because my mom used to drag there and choreograph and it was a block away from our house and I went to grade school there. So I would just, you know, come and hang out and um, I just wanted to be part of that world. So yes. that next year you did the show, what was your first show? Um, Sound of Music. Okay. All right. And I was Gretel. Gretel. All right. <laughs> uh, you hurt your finger. It's the only thing I remember about Gretel is she's the one yes. who made her finger hurt. Yes. Um, so what made you fall in love with theater and performing? I loved being drawn in, into another world. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, like any kid likes pretend at that age, it was just being sucked into a whole nother world. And I did it to the nth degree. Like I was sucked in unlike yeah. anything else. And I remember when my brother was in Maine there, he was young. What's the boy's name in Maine? Young oh, Patrick. Young yeah, Patrick. And I came to every rehearsal. Every rehearsal, I was there constantly. And then I remember when they were striking the set and taking it all down. And I remember sitting in the audience and just weeping because, like, my world was being dismantled. Like, I right. lived in that world for a while with everyone. I just dove right in. That as was had. It was so attractive to me as a kid to just be able to step out of reality and, and enter this fantasy that was full of action and emotion and music, oh, the music, you know? So that, it just sucked me in. I just wanted to do it ever since. Do you remember the first time that you ever were able to watch maybe, well, not maybe, but on film, a show that you were in and get to see it from that side because you couldn't see it, uh, you know, when you're on stage and kind of see it from that go and go, oh my God, I never got to see how that looked. When I was in Oliver, when I was in fifth grade, my grandfather videotaped it. So we watched those videotapes. Yeah. Was it a, was it a weird thing to kind of see and go, oh, I never knew that's what it looked like. No, I don't think so because we were double cast. So we would sit out there and watch it a okay. lot. So um, that was, that was something that allowed me to do theater as a kid because I was really sick. I was a sick child <laughs> and um i was in and out of hospitals a lot and i had a lot of surgeries and i so wanted to be involved but i couldn't unless they were doing a show that was double cast okay. because it would be very likely that i would i would miss a lot you know mm -hmm. should i should i get sick and stuff so um sound of music oliver um they were double casting and so i was able to be involved in those productions which was great i loved it I'm generally against double casting now. Yeah. <laughs> but I do see I do see for for shows that have kids, especially child leads that have a lot on their shoulders. Mm -hmm. I do understand that that's a, a good thing. Yeah. It was a good thing for me. It allowed me to be involved, so. Right, right. Yeah. So some questions for you as a director. Okay. What was your first directing job? I've only ever directed at Lincoln Way East. Okay. What was the first show that you... Um, 42nd Street, we did first. 
Okay. Uh, what scared you the most about going into that job? The tech side of it. Okay. Because I was completely, I know nothing about set construction, um, set design, lighting, nothing. And I didn't understand how much support I'd have. Mm -hmm. um, and so that scared me to death. And I, before, before I accepted the job, I said, look, I, this is not my, like, I can't do this. Right. You need a, you know, you need a tech director. You need some, um, and they, they gave me tons of help. So that was great. Um, that's what scared me. That's the yeah. only thing that scared me actually. What did you learn the most from that first time directing? How much I love working with kids, which okay. I've never done. It was my first time. Right. And I didn't think I'd be good at it. And I didn't think I'd like it the way I love it. And I didn't know how much it would give me, how much I would get. Um, but I absolutely love going there every day and working with those kids. It's just fantastic. Fantastic. And did you get any advice from anyone before you stepped into that, that role for the first time as a director? No, but I had, I had so many good directors in my life. I just figured I, you know, right. I had a lot of model, a lot of role models to help me out in that way. But, um, uh, I took to it immediately. I just, and it's a great group. You know, I don't know how I'd be directing in community theater with adults. Right. I kind of wonder, I don't know. I think it's very different. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I would believe that. Um, how many shows altogether have you done there? Five. Okay. And are there any that you specifically have done there that you would love to revisit maybe in the community theater set as the director and kind of redo it in a, in a different way. I'm afraid of directing adults. <laughs> I don't know. I, I probably will do it someday. Yeah. Um, especially if I stop uh, doing things at the high school, but um, I don't know, it scares me a little bit. Yeah. I, I can sort of, um, I can be very serious and professional about it with these kids. Mm -hmm. I, I can really set the tone of, look, this, we're not messing around. This is the craft. We're here to learn this craft. This is what we're doing. Um, and I take it extremely seriously. And I demand that they take it very seriously, too. I don't think that would fly in <laughs> community theater. I think there's too many people there just wanting to relax and socialize. And yeah. um, I get too much pushback of like, hey, you know, 7.30 at night and I've worked all day. I don't really need this level of, you know. Um, yeah. And I think that would frustrate me so much because when I do any project, I do it, you know, 110%. I just want it to be the best it can possibly be. And the kids are right there. They're eager and they're like, yes, you know, right. I can work. Tell me how hard to work and I'll work twice as hard. And I, I just. I think that that's a, it's a, it's a great point. I think that that's something that you can learn as a director the same way you learn as an actress with other actors that this person is not taking it as serious. And we all and know that, that this it. is a community theater is a social thing. You yeah. want to make friendships, relationships and whatnot. And, you know, I, I'm a person that always thinks I want to give as much as I can in a rehearsal to a director so they can edit what they don't want instead of not, you know, giving 50% and then they're always, I, you know, are they going to get there? That sort of thing. And, um, and I know that you are that sort of actress. You want to give what you can so they can, you know, not, I don't want to say fix it, but hone it to what it needs to be for this production. Um, and we know that there's actors that don't do that. So I think that's something that, you know, is very frustrating as just an actress, let alone probably a director. So I get, I get that. Yeah, it that will be. I, I think it. I probably will someday direct in community yeah. theater. I, it'll be interesting to see the, the dynamics and how I handle it. <laughs> it. It might just have to be one of those. It's got to be the right show at the right time. And it yeah. there may not be another one. It might be that one time I know plenty of people who directed that one show and then they went, I don't really have a desire to do another. I just wanted to do that one. So, um, so in the shows that you have done as a director, um, 
what is the hardest decision that you've had to make as a director for the good of everybody in the production? Have you had to get to that point? I've had to ask kids to leave the show. Okay. That was incredibly hard. Was it um, early on in the process, late in the process? Late. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, really, really how, hard. How did every, how did, how did the cast deal with that sort of thing? Fine. Okay. The cast dealt with it fine. I didn't deal well with it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the kind of thing where you set, um, you know, we set down rules. I have a, a meeting with the parents before we even audition the show. I do a parent meeting. Mm -hmm. If your child is auditioning, you have to come to this meeting or your child can't audition. And I say, here's what you're in for. Because I, I learned after the first year doing it, um, one of the biggest problems was parents not having a clue what their kid was getting involved in. Right. Um, and what it would mean for them and for their family and the sacrifices the family would have to make. So I said, they shouldn't let them audition if they don't understand what they're, you know. So we have a meeting. I explain everything that's going to be expected of them, all the schedules. I have them sign a piece of paper and I say, look, if this is violated, you know, if, if this, if you can't live up to this, I don't care if it's tech week, we're going to have to ask you to leave the show. And we've had to do it a couple times. And uh, it was uh, rough. Does the school have any sort of grade policy as far as they have to have a certain grade or a certain yeah. GPA? Yeah, yeah, and it wasn't, but it wasn't for that reason. You've never had that issue. No, okay. no, that wasn't the reason. It was uh, not. It was not coming for one reason or another. You know, not. I'm not going to be there. Yeah. Now you said that the the cast adapted to it pretty well. Was it something they were, they were fine. expecting? Yeah, they. Okay. No, I, yeah, they were fine because they they all know this. Like if this, if this is right. an issue, if this happens, you're not going to, and they think some kids think, oh, they're not really going to kick me out. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we are. And, and that's why we had to go follow through with it. Cause if you say that and then you don't follow through with it, right. what, what good is anything? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was the hardest thing that I've ever had to deal with and hated it. Absolutely hated it. But there it is, you know? Yeah. yeah. So when you are watching people audition, students at this point for, for you, what are you looking for when they're auditioning? Never perfection. Never, um, um, kids, especially at that age, think, um, if my voice cracks, if I forget the words, if I can't do all the dance steps, that's, that's why I'm not going to get in the show. And they don't understand. And I do do an audition. I do an audition workshop too, before audition. Um, and what they don't understand is that means nothing to me. What I'm looking for is an energy. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for a person that makes me want to look at them. Right. I don't really care how your voice cracked or if you forgot, you know, half of the verse or whatever. Do you make me want to look? Right. Do you make me, do you make me want to pay attention? Um, because we have so many kids that come just quiet as a mouse because they're scared of messing up. Right. And so they do their little, you know, hushed, quiet, blah, 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 blah. and I tell them, like, I'm not going to remember. There's 30 of you that do that. I'm not going to remember any of you, mm -hmm. you know, come mess up and mess up loud right. and bring your full personality and your energy and your willingness to be a part of this, you know, and let me feel that from you and you're, you're in, I will find a way to use you, right. you know? Of the five that you've done, is there one that you feel is the, the favorite one that you worked on? Yes, hun Hunchback, who knows your name. Okay. Yes. What was yeah. the, Was there a reason? Um, <laughs> so I, I do these, um, I, I'm the uh, director and chore choreographer, and then Anne McMahon, who is actually a Chicago actress, she works everywhere. She teaches at uh, Roosevelt, but she's worked at Goodman and at um, mm -hmm. everywhere in Chicago, Marriott and everything. Um, and she lives in Frankfurt here and she musically directs with me. Okay. And we chose the show because we had the voices. Right. We knew we had the voices and we both loved the show. So we started um, and we had only done one show together before this and we started rehearsing and we're maybe three weeks in, four weeks in, and she starts glancing over at me <laughs> during rehearsals, and I would glance over at her, 
and then we'd get a break and we'd be like, is it just me? Is it just me? Is it just me? Like, this is going to be amazing. It's, yeah. It was one of those, it was one of those situations where every single puzzle piece was there to make right. the puzzle. And that magic thing that you can't put your finger on that so many shows just for some reason have, and you can't put your finger on it. Why was that so good? Like, why did that work so well? Why didn't this? And it should have, you know, that hunchback had everything just perfectly placed. And it was so good. So early that we were doing this whole, like, don't get excited. Don't get excited. Don't get excited. <laughs> We've got a long way to go yet. And then it just kept building and building and building. And honestly, I mean, I've done theater for 40 years, more than 40 years. I don't think as long as I live, I will ever do anything as good as Hunchback at the high school. It was so great. Yeah. It was just so great. I just wept. I wept through every rehearsal. I wept at the performances. I was so proud of those kids who worked so hard. They yeah. worked for it. You know, it didn't just happen. They worked at the demanding show. Oh, absolutely. And, um, demanding for outside of high school. Oh, and my gosh. Imagine the, the kids in high school. Being oh, like my that. gosh. And we didn't have a, a you know, separate choir. It often has, like, just a choir right. just to sit and sing all the, that thick music. No, our kids had to do it running around, running up and down flights of stairs. Um, mm. incre just incredible. I mean, I, I don't. That's an experience I will relive and relive and relive. And it just, it was sort of the apex yeah. <laughs> of everything. It was wonderful. Fantastic. So now some questions for you as an actress. Okay. What okay. is your favorite role that you have played? Oh, I'm not going to be able to give you an answer for that. <laughs> There's so many. I can't, like, I just can't. How There's about so a, many. a couple of them um, that, that really stick out? Dot, okay. Dot. I mean, just Dot, because, and it's not even that that particular role, but the show itself. Yeah. And, and that entire show, um, working with my family on that show, um, yeah. and so many close friends. Um, that set <laughs> painted by Jane Nix and so many others who helped her, but had, you know, she headed up the pen. I mean, that set was just perfection. And, um, uh, it was, yeah, it was a great experience. Loved playing dot. That's definitely in the top three. Um, okay. um, I loved playing Morticia. Yeah. I loved playing Morticia. I loved Belle. I love the iconic parts that people have something to reference. Yes. You know, oh, they've seen the TV show, they've seen the cartoon, they've seen that. I love taking those, that character that is already known, and then bringing her to life in a different way. Okay. Um, I love doing that. That's lots of fun. Um, I loved Millie in Thrilly Modern Millie. It was probably the hardest I've ever worked on stage. Yeah. Um, but so much fun. Such a great role. Okay. Um, yeah. Is there a role that has gotten away? Oh, yeah. So many. Um, I always, no I always wanted to play Esther in Meet Me in St. Louis. <laughs> okay. um, post, like, way gotten away by, like, 25, 30 years, I would have loved to be Mary in Secret Garden. Okay. Um, the role has gotten away. Um, it, this didn't get away from me, but I know I'll never play it, but I would have loved to have been able to play Evita, but I don't, I'm not a, vo I'm vocally, I'm not in Evita. Okay. So, um, that's just something I, I wouldn't feel comfortable auditioning for, but man, I wish I could, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, yeah, those are the ones that pop to mind. And then I've gotten to play so many you know, that were on my dream list, so. So that's the next question. Is there a dream role that you have yet to play? Only Sally and Follies. Okay. And I have a while, I can do that for a while. Now see, I wouldn't have guessed, I would, I, I can see it, but I wouldn't have guessed you, you'd be interested in Sally more than uh, Phyllis. Oh no, I love Sally. Okay. I love her, I love her music. Yeah. 
I love the tenderness and the sadness of Sally. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully I, Sunday. Nobody does it anymore, but I know um, it's one of my favorite of Sondheim shows. And I, I fell in love with it even more after the last revival and actually getting, you know, a full complete album and, watching uh, so much of it on YouTube. They've got all the, the bootlegs of it, of seeing things. And I mean, just the way that they did the whole Loveland sequence and just, you know, Bernadette standing there absolutely still singing a song. I mean, it was, yeah, mm -hmm. I get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's a show I would love to work on in some capacity, but like you said, it doesn't happen very often. So uh what role have you found to be the most difficult fun home okay Al allison and fun home very difficult uh why did you find it difficult um so okay couple couple reasons um she's unlike me in a lot of ways okay. um just physicality I had to really work. I videotaped myself and um, I had to work on the way I walk mm -hmm. and the way I sit down. And um, I can't really think of another role that I've had to do that with. Yeah. Um, so that was hard. I think that's just because I've, it, it was an added level I've never dealt with. I was like, Gina, you, you have to walk different. You know, you have right. to move different. You have to, um, your hand, your hand movements have to be different. That was kind of hard breaking me down at my age. Yeah. Like maybe if I'm 20, it'd be easier to break that down. But like how I move my body is so ingrained in me now that to watch it and like, you know, no, you know, erase that. We've got to, we got to come up with something else. So just physicality, that was hard. Also, um, unexpectedly hard. I act, absolutely don't interact with anyone else in that show mm -hmm. and strictly an observer. So even though, yes, watching and observing is interacting somewhat, it's not really. And, and it's, that was difficult for me to not yeah. have people to play off of. Right. Um, and I didn't expect that. Because when you watch that show as an audience member, she seems so integrated into it. Right. But as an actress, you don't. You feel very isolated in that show. Yeah. So no, I, I get that because you could easily take her – out and even though the story jumps around in time you could take her out as a narrator and the show could still essentially stand on its own mm -hmm. but any other person you take out it's going to kind of falter here and there but yeah no i get that because she's yeah nobody speaks yeah. to me. yeah no one ever speaks to me nobody looks at me and i you know? i will definitely say i will agree on the whole walking thing because i can look back on it watching it and and thinking she even thinking yeah she's walking yeah it, it, it seemed a little more as as odd as it says it seemed a little more masculine which makes sense for the character because allison was a little more butch yeah i think i was think trying to i know i i don't i didn't look a lot like her but i watched tons of interviews and i was really just trying to be a real person yeah. like i i wasn't trying to be my version of allison i really wanted to be allison Bechtel. right you know, so I, I studied her. Um, it just didn't come as easily as I thought it would. And when I thought I was doing things, I would, because I videotape myself often, I would watch it back. I'm like, yeah, that's not, <laughs> you're not doing what you think you're doing. <laughs> so um, that was, that was a struggle. But I like that. I like, you know, having something to struggle with. Yeah. It's part of the process. What role have you found to be the most fun? I think that Morticia was the most fun. Okay. Hands down, because I had no costume changes. I never had to change my costume, which I love. I hate costume changes. <laughs> and the costume was fantastic. And it's such a, um, that sh show moves so well. Mm -hmm. It just flows and moves. And you're in and out as Morticia, but you get a little bit of time to rest, but not too much time. And it's hysterical. And her dry you know mm -hmm. the the dryness of her humor and her her line delivery and also i'm not a natural smiler i have like resting bitch face like to smile i have to consciously think you need to smile or people are going to think you hate them 
like to have a whole show where I didn't have to smile. That was yeah. like heaven for me. <laughs> um, I just loved that show. That was so much fun. So much fun. Uh, which role have you done that you have found was the most rewarding? Probably Sunny in the Park. Okay. Um, not only because I love the show for personal reasons, but because I think it was very well received and a lot of those people who were in that audience had never seen it. Right. Had no clue what it was. And I think um, it's such a beautiful piece. And I love, I loved the feeling of introducing that to people. Right. Of saying, here, look at this. What do you think about it? You know, and there was, you know, some people hate that show. Yeah. Some people hate, some people hate the second act of that show. Some people, you know, but I loved talking about it. And I loved having audience members coming up to me and saying, wow, I just never even knew that show existed. Wow. It's, you know, I have to think about this, you know, that kind of thing. So that was rewarding. That was very rewarding. Uh, what has been your greatest accomplishment as an actress? An actress? Yeah. Wow. I don't, I don't think of acting that way, I guess. If you had said as a director, yeah, I would just say, I would, as a director, I would just say, you know, what I've, what I've helped my kids learn yeah. um, about the craft. As an actress, I just feel like I get. Like, I don't feel like I accomplish or give a lot. I feel like I just get, I feel like acting is just a gift to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know that I would even think about it in those terms. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me see. Where, where, where was I? How do you feel about revisiting roles that you have performed in the past? I don't like it. I don't like to do any role twice. The only, the only role, role I've done t uh, twice was Ula and the producers. Because it was so much fun. It was yeah. a blast. But um, in general, I don't like to. I like each production to be its own special thing that just sort of lives there forever in a bubble. And I don't want to redo. Now, it, are there any ones that you think now that maybe you played when you were younger that you could still play again or maybe, you know, maybe it's been 10 years or something like that that you think my life has changed enough that I would take this character in a different way? No. Okay. So what role, nope, I've already asked that question. Um, <laughs> as an actress, what do you feel are your favorite attributes of a good director? I really appreciate a director that has a strong vision, but is completely willing to sit and have a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like sometimes I get, sometimes I've experienced a director with no vision that literally just says, go, you know, do whatever. Um, or a director who's so, this is, this is the only thing, you know, this is what I want, give it to me or, and, you know, there's no talking about it. Yeah. Um, but I love the mixture of the two. I think that you have to have a strong vision as a director, you, you know, or else you won't end up with something that's focused and, and what you want it to be. Um, but, and I do believe that the director should make final decisions about that character. I do. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I think that the actor should feel free and comfortable to talk about it. And, and usually one-to-one -one is great. Like, I don't think it should be done at notes. Right. You know? Um, but I think that the actor should always strive for what the director wants to create. But it's nice to have that freedom to, you know, because sometimes a director um, can feed off of that, you know, feed off of an actor's ideas. But it's ultimately, I want a strong director. I want a strong Absolutely. director with a, with a strong vision. Even so if it's not my a, own, even if I disagree, I'd prefer okay. that. So the next question is, is three parts. What is your biggest pet peeve 
about directors as an actress? <clears throat> um um i think my biggest pet peeve i was thinking so long because there's many but i think my biggest pet peeve is um to let what they would consider to be small details just wash like just go by okay. like i got the attitude of i got bigger things to worry about yeah. i hate that i hate it there there's nothing small if if i'm sitting in the audience and my eye washes over it for a half of a second it's not small mm -hmm. so um attend to it if you don't have time to attend to it find someone on your staff or someone who's willing to help to attend to it but get it done get it fixed right there's just nothing in a show i mean we're all putting everything we have into it we're spending three you know months of our life every night coming to rehearse this how many thousands of dollars is going into this don't you know don't let anything fall by the wayside right finish it up finish the job you know but so yeah. many times I feel like it's just like, uh, as long as this is fine, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Or who's going to, who's going to notice that I'm going to notice it. Absolutely. Know? So Absolutely. I think that's my biggest pet peeve, biggest pet peeve. Second pet peeve is, um, absolutely no direction whatsoever. You know, I cast good people. And so let's now just put it all on their shoulders. They'll be fine. You yeah know? well we didn't we can't see ourselves right um we're not going to be fine we need a leader so lead um and then just little things like i hate directors that just sit in one place you know and don't and don't sit way over on the side who those people pay the same price for their ticket than the person mm -hmm. who is sitting in the center you know move around get up and move that kind of thing <laughs> oh i get that but yeah um so, and this one might be a, a more difficult one because of having only direct with the high school kids. The next one would be, what is your biggest pet peeve about actors as a director? Oh, well, I can only answer that in regards to high school kids, but I would imagine it wouldn't be too different. Um, if you don't, if you don't want to be here, don't be here. And I think it would be, I think that would be my same answer for community theater. Mm -hmm. There's lots of ways to socialize. If you just want to come to go out with the cast for drinks afterwards, do that. Yeah. But why spend all this time <laughs> coming to rehearsal for something that you're not going to put forth all of your effort into? Why? Why? Why are you here? Exactly. And like we started out at the high school with a huge, I think we had like almost 90 kids my first year because that's mm -hmm. how they wanted it. And as the years went by and I realized, I could have a voice and I could say, Hey, this is what we're going to do with this program. We've, you know, shrunk it every year, shrunk it, shrunk it, shrunk it, because we have decided to make it our demand so high on those kids that the, the kids who really don't want to be there have fallen by the wayside. And the product we get is, you know, much, high, much better. Yes. So I would suggest that to people in community theater, maybe do other things to socialize. Or, yeah. or work on crew or, you know what I'm saying? Be part of it, be here with us. But if you're going to spend all that time at rehearsal and, and put yourself on stage and pre present this as a work of art to the community, I mean, I think you should, that's weighty. That has some weight to it. Yeah. So, so give everything that you have. Yeah. So the third part is your biggest pet peeves about actors as an actor, about your fellow actors on stage. Not looking into my eyes. Okay. Um, that's usually something that we just talk about immediately and then that's fixed. But um, 
Um, I love actors that try a million different things, but then at a certain point, you need to set it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I recently did um, Little Women at KVTA. And the girl who played Joe was, let's see, I was 48 or whatever when I did that. She was 22 or something, Becky. Mm -hmm. um, as a 48-year-old woman who has done this for my entire life, I came to rehearsal every day and I learned from that girl. Yeah. Um, she's was this 22-year-old kid who came from her job or from work or whatever every single day to rehearsal and just would end up dripping in sweat from the effort she put forth every day at rehearsal. And she would just try everything. She was just throwing stuff at the wall, you know, to see if it would stick. And she tried and tried and tried and tried and inspired us all. Like, yeah. oh, this is, this is what rehearsing should be, you know? But then at a certain point, she figured out what worked, what didn't work, and it stayed there. And it was brilliant. Yeah. And she, she taught me a lot. That kid taught me so much about rehearsing. You know, and I love that about theater. I love that um, we are all coming together and we just learn from each other and watch each other. And, and I went back to my kids at the high school and I would talk about her, you know, and I would say, look, I'm, I'm learning. Yeah. I've been doing this my whole life, but I'm here. I'm in a show. I'm in a community theater show. I go to rehearsal and I'm learning from this kid, Right. you know, so that's a beautiful thing about theater. But anyway, back, I went around. Anyway, yes, try a million things, but then set it, you know? Yeah. So that we know what to expect, and I know what to expect from you, and you know what to expect from me. If a show was created about you, who would play you? Oh, that's so hard. Who would you like, who, who do you imagine playing you? <sighs> If the next big musical on Broadway was, you know, Vatooch the musical. <laughs> I have no idea. I know who'd want to play me, but I'm who, I know who I would want to play me, but she's, not, she's nothing like me, but I would want her to play me. What's oh. her name? That just did, what's her name that just did company? Kat, K Katrina Lenk. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm obsessed with her, but she's oh. nothing like me, but she, that's she, right. she maybe she can anyway. figure it out. She can figure it out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, what is your approach to learning lines? I've never had to have one until recently. I never had a problem ever learning lines until I got to like, I don't know, age 46 or 47. And then my brain isn't working the way it used to work. Um, so what I do is I take my recorder on my phone and I get my script out and I say everybody else's line. And then I say my own lines silently in my head mm -hmm. so that when I play that scene on my phone, I can just, you know, rehearse my lines with, with the other people's lines being spoken. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what I do. But I didn't used to have to do anything. I would just, it would happen through osmosis at rehearsal. Yeah. Several people have talked about a, an app called line learner. And I think yeah, that's I what it does. It. I heard about that. Yeah. 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 Uh, everybody seems to have a different, slightly different approach other than using this app on how to learn their lines. I always find it fascinating who does what. Um, so this was, a, this was a specific submitted question for you. Do you have to be very careful with your voice since you use it every day for your career? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the follow-up question to that that I would ask is, what ways do you take care of your voice daily so you can use it for work and performing? This problem has sort of taken care of itself um, about, well, I mean, I, I've always had health issues throughout my whole life, mm -hmm. um, one, kind of one thing after another. And sort of in my 30s, I started changing my diet drastically took care of so much of the reflux and the allergies and yeah. And, um, I made even more drastic changes in my forties and it helped even more. Okay. So, um, 
my diet changes that I've done for other reasons have really impacted my voice positively. Um, so that's a big one. But also, um, like I rehearsed at the high school in the green room, which is very, it's like a ca huge cavern with tile and cement and it, everything echoes. And I've got, you know, 50 kids in there yelling. There's no way I could do a four hour, four hour rehearsal four days a week without a mic. So yeah. I definitely used, um, a, a, you know, had mic, bass mic um, for rehearsal so I can speak in a normal tone and they can all hear me. Mm -hmm. That helps a lot. I would have no voice. I don't know how teachers do it. <laughs> I would have no voice. Um, yeah. Plus, you know, we've got tracks going on and they're like, how, how are they going to hear me yelling at them when, anyway, right. yeah. So the mic helps a lot. Um, but then besides that, just all the same things you always hear, you know, rest, diet, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, another submitted question. I didn't get the, I don't ever ask for names. I don't know why this was submitted for you, but the question was, how do you feel about singers who smoke? I don't have any opinion. I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know why it was submitted. I, I don't know if they thought the questions were for me because I have opinions about that, but I, it, it said it was for you, but it was, how do you feel? So maybe they thought you had an opinion on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't have an opinion. I'm amazed. Yeah. I, I know a lot of singers who smoke and I'm amazed. Yeah. Like, like how do you do it? So no, but it's, you know, that's your business. <laughs> uh, do you have any pre-performance rituals? Um, lots of fluids, lots of liquid. Go to the bathroom a lot. Uh, I hate, um, I don't want to touch my script. Once I'm, um, memorized, once I'm off book, I don't want to see that script. Okay. Like I, sometimes I see actors leafing through their scripts, like on performance days, like right before I'm like, how do you do? That would make me crazy. Right. Um, just, just relaxing, just drinking, drinking, drinking. Like I can't drink enough. And then I'll, I'll pee. Like if I'm off stage for three minutes, I'll run and pee. Cause I'm just drinking, drinking, drinking. Yeah. I, I can't get enough fluid when I'm performing. Okay. Tea, tea, water. Yeah. That'd be it. If you had a magic wand to end all of this pandemic, whatever word you want to use, what show would you like to start rehearsals on? Can I finish the one that got canceled? <laughs> um, let's show what I like to start rehearsals on. Hmm. Um, as an actress or as a director? As, a, as an actress. Oh. Hmm. I don't know. There's not, you know what? There's not too much left on my list anymore. Like I said, I like to do follies, but I think that's a little bit ways away. Um, not a whole lot on my list. Now, I did hear The Devil Wears Prada is coming mm -hmm. out. You know, I yeah. would love to be Miranda. I'd love to be Miranda Priestly. So, but another, I need, another I need, show where you don't have to smile. I, <laughs> I can only imagine that it, that's going to be a great character to play. Um, oh, but I haven't, heard, sure. I haven't heard it or anything. Or, you know. No, I don't think they've even put. Okay anything out about it because is it it's Elton yeah. John writing it right that's what I heard I think yeah I think he's writing the score yeah I don't think I've I don't think they put anything out so I would love to play that. even unheard I would love to play yeah. that part yeah yeah but there's not too much on the list besides that honestly I mean is there just a show that you just I, I, I'd love to work on this show even if it's not a repeat thing that maybe it's not a role that you're like yeah I want to play this but a show I've just always wanted to work on. Nothing's popping in my head right now. Okay. If, it pop, if it pops in there while we're talking, I'll, I'll let you know. All right. In your opinion, what makes a good player a musical? Easy. That's an easy one to answer. Um, I have been to Broadway shows that left me 
bored to tears checking my phone. And I have been to junior high performances in cafetoriums mm -hmm. where I forgot where I was. Okay. It is not the slickness of the show. It is not the experience of the actors. It is the heart and the energy and the ability to suck me in. Okay. If I'm sitting in the audience analyzing a show, saying, mm, I, wasn't, I didn't like that choreography, that costume doesn't look right. If I'm doing that, if I'm in a place where I can do that, then that's not a good show. If I don't care and I've just been sucked in and I forgot how long I've been sitting there and where I'm sitting exactly and I'm just in, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with the character and I feel what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. That's all I care about. Yeah. That's all. That's why I'm there. That's why I buy a ticket. Yeah. I buy a ticket to come into your world, to step into your world. So bring me in. Figure out how you need to bring me in and bring me in. Yeah. Otherwise, it's, I've wasted, you know, that money. And you've wasted your time. So that is the, the only thing to me that matters in a show. And with the, the difference between a good show and a bad show. I, uh, I did that with Wicked. Sat there and checked your phone. Well, well, this was this was when it was in the Chicago run, so before smartphones were really a big thing. But I had already watched the bootleg of the original cast online, which I was very much, even though I think it's very much a musical for teenage girls, I was pulled into it. Mm -hmm. I watched it. But then months later, and this was, I don't know how far into the run, Anna Gasteyer wasn't there anymore. Um, I went and saw it in Chicago, back of the orchestra level with a friend, and we just sat there with each other. And for the first half of the first act, um, specifically, we were just paying attention to all the technical aspects and the costumes. And then we noticed that over in front of, you know, audience right, we were at a Wednesday matinee, there was a death school. And the two interpreters were way more into the show than all the people on stage. And we started watching them. This man and this woman, we started watching them and going, I pay to watch them before I pay to watch these people again. Not that they weren't great, but it was one of those things where I feel like they were in a run for so long and it was, oh, it's a Wednesday matinee sort of attitude. So whose job does that become, Tyler? When the director of a professional uh, tour, tour production, whatever like that, is no longer present, um, whose job is that? To, to take a, a, a production and say, you know, we've, got, we've gone to a bad place. From what I understand, it should be the stage manager. Okay. That's what I've understood about professional. Th the, I know that when I was doing the understudy stuff for Smokey Joe's at the Royal George, they, um, the director was not there very often. Um, the associate director, who was also the associate producer, was there a little more often because, um, you know, you had to, uh, as an understudy, you had to come to the show once a week. Um no, it was the girl that was the stage manager. She ran everything. Mm -hmm. But the only thing that the that she didn't run was uh, the uh, the associate producer came there and did the laundry a lot, and washed everybody's costumes. Um, but no, it was it was pretty much her. She stayed on top of who showed up on what performances, who was doing this, who you know that sort of thing. That's what I've understood. Um, it's such a danger with professional theater, you know, yeah. and I felt that so many times, Yeah, like so many times. And I, it's supposed to be, I think, that way and that when a director in a long run comes back and sees it, you know, don't, doesn't always say, hey, I'm coming back tonight because you don't, you know, you're there to retake notes. There's mm -hmm. a very, um, uh, on that subject, there's a very interesting story I once read about, um, when little Abner was on Broadway, there's the ballroom scene and Abner's supposed to be, of course, a terrible dancer. 
And the guy who played him was a terrible dancer. And about four months into the run, he had gotten really good at it. (laughs) And the director came back and called a specific rehearsal for him and said, you look too good. And that's not Abner. And basically had a whole rehearsal reteaching him how to be a bad dancer. But that's what it was. It took the director coming back. No one else had noticed because it was a subtle change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then someone who hadn't been there for months came back and went, whoa, whoa, whoa. So the, so I don't know. Again, the, at least with that production of Wicked, they were fine on stage. There were some people that I was like, uh, guy playing Fiero. Um, but <laughs> then these two down here, it wasn't, the, what I loved about it was that they weren't just signing. They were signing and acting at the same mm-hmm. time, which was fantastic. And I'm sure that they, by that time they knew the show. Um. And, you know, they didn't really have to wait. Um, A production that I just did recently, we had a a young girl for a Christmas story come and see the show with her parents and she had to have an interpreter. And we got them all set up. They were on the side of the stage, cast all new. They didn't know, I don't believe they knew the show at all. They got a copy of the script in front of them, Mm -hmm. which I told them, just be aware there's going to be some slight differences in some of these things. Not everybody has got some of these monologues down verbatim. And they said, oh, no, we listen, of course. So, of course, there was that delay, but I didn't pay attention to them because they weren't acting out the show. Um, but that, that was kind of that thing that I got with Wicked. I'm like, someone bought me these tickets for my birthday, and I kind of felt bad with the fact that I stopped paying attention to the show. Because it wasn't pulling me in the same way I have with other things. Yeah, that is so the I get that. number one. That's the number one thing. Yeah. The number one thing. I have, I a, story about that. I have a story about that if you want a story about that. Go for it. Okay. So um, when we were doing Oklahoma, my we were maybe only four weeks into it. So granted, we were still, you know, learning things. They were le- just finishing learning music and whatever. And the kids did a... And I don't come to most um, musical rehearsals. Um, and the kids were performing the song Oklahoma for a fundraiser. Uh-huh. And I went to that and I had not heard them sing it. Um, and I was so upset <laughs> I heard them sing Oklahoma <laughs> that the next time we had rehearsal, I said, uh, you know what we're supposed to be doing today? We'll cross that off the schedule. The only thing we're doing today is the song Oklahoma. And it was because they did not understand anything about, even though I had done a little bit of a a history lesson before we started the show, Mm -hmm. um, they didn't understand anything about what those people would be feeling. Yeah. You know, and and, um, what was right in front of them, you know, everything they had been working so hard for and sacrificed everything for and risked so much for is just right in front of us, just four inches away from their hands and it's almost there, you know, and the whole beat of that song and the train come, you know, and they didn't get all of that. Once it's explained and laid out and they understand who they're playing, right? every person in that ensemble, I said, when I, when I come to see Oklahoma, I wait for that song, but the hair on my neck should stand up. You know, I should feel your yearning and your excitement and your, I almost have everything I want. And once those kids got it and they soaked it up like a sponge, actors want to be inspired Mm -hmm. and they want to understand who they are and who who they're portraying. And oh my God, every time those kids sang Oklahoma, you know, from that time on, it was just great. It was what it should be. And I think the problem is so many times we just think we're, you know, singing singing pretty music and, and, and dancing pretty, like if we, like if we just do the elements, let's make the music sound really good. Let's have pretty costumes. Let's do some nice dances. You know, um, you've, you've missed the entire point. All those things just serve one purpose, which is to make us feel something, Mm -hmm. you know, so you better be making us feel what we want to feel and what that composer intended us to feel what that writer that whoever wrote the book intended us to feel, figure that out first. And then let all those other elements just serve that one purpose. Yeah. 
And then you've got to show where people don't, you know, check their phones in. Yeah. I also don't check my phone because I'm one of those few people that turns it off. <laughs> that actually listens to that announcement and goes, and my phone's going off in my pocket. Um, I check it under my jacket so the light doesn't bother. No, because I got yelled at once for it and <laughs> ever since then. <laughs> and it was the worst. It was when I was the understudy at, <laughs> at the Royal George. I was so, you know, by that time I'd seen it week after week. And I was just sitting there, and I was nowhere where anybody would see me. I was way at the very last row, not bothering anybody in the audience. There was nobody around me. And I was just sitting there with my stylus. That's the type of phone I had. And I was just periodically looking down and playing Sudoku while I was watching the show. And rightly so, the stage manager called me out afterward on it because she saw it. And I apologized, and I said, no, you're right. I shouldn't have been. And I never did it again. Phone was off in the side, in my pocket. That's, yeah. Um, I'm one of those people, yeah, I got yelled at for a while. I, the same thing happened with, you know, the D.A.R.E. program at school. I'm one of those few kids that someone came in and go, look at what your lungs will look like if you smoke. And I went, I'm never smoking again. <laughs> and it scared me ever since then. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, if is there a novel or a movie that you love that you – would love to see someone adapt into a stage musical and why? Oh, I wish I had these ahead of time. <laughs> Everybody says work. that, but I like the, the sort of spontaneousness. But oh. I'm not good at that. Like a lot of things I have to think about because I, I have the worst memory. A novel or movie that I would love to see turn into a stage player musical. I mean, there's got to be, but I'm just like, why am I? What, are there any of your favorite movies that you go, oh, I could see that? So I love a straight play made of the movie Holiday. Do you know the movie Holiday? With um, Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant. Um, no, I don't think I do. Oh, uh, I would love, a, not a musical, but a play made of that, mm -hmm. that movie. Okay. It's one of my all-time favorite movies. I watch it like four times a year. Um, it's about a rich girl from a rich family who wants her to do a certain thing, having the guts to say, screw you all. I'm going to go, you know, right. live the life I want to live. I love it. Um, what else? What else? What else? Yeah, that's it for now. No, I'm I sure the answer, I'm sure I have many, but I can't. I think else. that's a good answer. If that's a mm -hmm. movie that you love. Yeah. What sort of stories inspire you as an actress? So many. Um, no, no specific story. Um, I mean, what inspires me as an actress is any, I, I don't have trouble finding inspiration as an actress. Mm -hmm. I love, what inspires me as an actress is just to figure out that person. Whatever, whatever, whether it's Peggy Sawyer or, you know, I, I don't, there's no fluff to me. Okay. I don't, I don't ever see musicals as being fluff. Everything has an arc. Everything has a story mm -hmm. and there's some lesson and something relatable in, in everything. Yeah. And just because it has humor or it's old or whatever, there's something to be found there, you know? And I, that's how we keep those things fresh too. Right. You know? take that old musical, but make those characters so believable and relatable that this, this musical is now fresh, you know? Um, what inspires me as an actress is just the process of figuring out my character. Okay. But not a specific, it doesn't have to be a specific type of character or a specific storyline. Okay. So in the roles that you've played, you've played some characters that would be defined as heroes so to speak you know the the good guy and you've played a few characters that could be considered more the the antagonist or the villain not enough i haven't played enough villains not a lot no i'd love to okay of the few that you've played which one have you preferred to play more and which one did you find more fun i'm even trying to think of villains 
We played Fastrada. That's a villain. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, villains are fun, right? <laughs> I mean, villains I, I are that's fun. That's the general consensus. Yeah, villains are fun because they're so unlike ourselves and because they're so necessary to that story mm -hmm. and because they add so much zest to, you know, it's fun. It's fun. To, yeah, that's fun. Um, Anj, you know, I was stuck for a long time as the ingenue and that's challenging. Yeah. People don't understand how challenging being the ingenue is because, Oh, it can be so bland and forgettable. Yes. Um, we're not given a lot of good stuff to work with. Mm -hmm. ingenues aren't you know all they had to be back in the day was pretty yeah and that's not enough to us anymore so um to play an ingenue is actually extremely challenging and um you have to work harder at it i think well, i think um, it's to make if they're not a comedic ingenue which doesn't right. happen often right. it's making them likable i think is probably the biggest challenge because there's a lot of them that especially in the older shows like you mentioned with um like you mentioned oklahoma Lori is a lot of times not viewed as very likable right and i think that's can be a challenge that i mean she's not 100 percent your most traditional ingenue but that's i think that i, I get what you're saying in that and that it's yeah and that's kind of dead you know we don't really write ingenues anymore do we because really. we don't like that we don't want that character's not as real to us and we don't yeah, our, our, our ingenues now, modern ingenues have some sort of moxie and some sort of, yeah. you know, yeah, which is great. Lot, that's a lot better. Yeah. I forgot what the question was. <laughs> it was, which one do you, which one do you prefer playing? Oh, I think the villain. Did you answer no, which one was more fun? Definitely the villain. And also, I've not, I've not gotten to play enough villains. Well, was, you kind was, of said that, you know. There's a role that you want to play that I would say would probably be the ultimate antagonist for a woman. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. So, but is she the villain? I, w I wouldn't call her the villain necessarily as much as I would say the antagonist. She's the antagonist, but yeah, I think we... But I would say that um, I can't remember the other secretary's name. Yeah, I can't either. I would say she she's closer that to Emily a Blunt. villain. Blunt. Yeah, the one that Emily Blunt played. She's closer to a villain. But really, it's it would be Miranda would be the the antagonist yeah. I would say. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I hope that happens someday. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have there been any big onstage flubs over the years that Tyler, maybe, don't. maybe Tyler. at the time weren't Tyler, funny? Don't. don't Tyler. But now you just laugh you and laugh. Well, no, you well know, you well know, you were there. You were there. You didn't. I was. See it. Yes, I talked to you. I had this conversation with you. You were there that night, and you didn't see it because you were sitting in a different part of the audience. But I told you about it. Tyler, White Christmas. <sighs> I've completely forgotten. You're a liar. You're a no. Liar. I'm. I'm not. When you just said this, I instantly started thinking of. All right. Did something happen in Fun Home? Here it goes. I, my, what, my mic did not work in the beginning of act two. I said to myself, this is not a problem because every time I'm on it during act two, I am next to someone with a mic. Yeah. Or I'm singing my big solo and I have a live, cause that mic was live, that live standing mic. I'm like, I'll be fine without a mic in act two. No problem. I come off after scene one, there's like three crew guys who like attack me. They're like, your mic's not working. You're like, quick, you have to, we have to change your mic. Well, my mic is duct taped to my thigh and I have to change into a gown and be on the other side of the stage. I'm like, no, I can't, I can't, I have no time to give you my mic off my thigh and go, they're like, you have to, and I'm freaking out and they're freaking out. So I'm ripping off the mic and I'm yelling to people, go get, go get my dress. It's on that side of the stage. People are running for me. It's chaos. I am now wearing nude dance tights. Mm -hmm nude underwear nude quick character shoes and a nude bra that's it and i say to myself okay the dress is over there i know that the scene going on right now the, the, the act curtain's closed yeah 
And so I'm going to run across the stage to go get my dress. And I run full force onto the stage looking completely nude, even though I have a bra and tights on and the curtain is not closed. Okay. I remember you and talking you were about there. that. You were there. Here, here, and I don't know if I told you this before. I didn't see that because I left after I love a piano. Right. That's right. You left. Yeah. I left because I hate the show, but I stayed. <laughs> I, I can't stand it, but I stayed for I Love a Piano because Lewis is a good friend of mine. I'm like, I'll stay for his big number in the second <laughs> act. And then I was just like, also the fact that I was just like, oh my God. We're all, there's still two more songs of act one and we've been here for an hour and a half. It's the longest show. But no, now I remember you telling me that, but I didn't get to see it. Darn. There's a... <laughs> There's, there's more. Oh. As, I run, as I run onto the stage and I see that the curtain's not closed, because now my body, the momentum of my body is carrying me farther onto the stage. So I just knew I had to stop my body weight from going any farther. So I tried to stop my own body and I fracture my foot trying to do that. So I finished all of act two yes. with a fractured foot, having two thirds of the audience have seen me run apparently nude onto the stage. Now I remember. Now I remember you telling me about it because I asked you what happened with your, because you said something online about your foot and I asked you what happened with your foot. I what cried, did I miss? I cried for days. Oh my God. It was but do the you most look back at now and laugh? Only years later. Okay. It was the most horrifying horrifying experience of my life. I wanted to crawl under a rock. I was so embarrassed at the unprofessionalism. <sighs> There's nothing to say. Go on. Okay. Let's go on. Okay. What do you think are some of the most important lessons that theater teaches? <sighs> Here's how I'm going to choose to answer that. This is why I love theater. I think that we live in a society where too many, this is not true of everyone, but too many of us don't like to look within. And we busy ourselves with as much as we can busy ourselves with mm -hmm. to keep running the rat race and getting what we think we want and what we think we don't have, <clears throat> whether it's friends or this or money or that or attention or whatever. And theater is a safe roundabout way to get people who otherwise would not mm -hmm. look internally. And they don't even think they're doing it. They think they're at a show. Uh, to support their friends or because they like theater or whatever and they don't understand is happening is that theater is holding a mirror up to us and reflecting us back at ourselves and even though it's a subconscious process for the audience member we're seeing things happen on that stage and we're analyzing that and our role in that and what that means in our society and we're seeing these themes play out that are relevant to our lives. Mm -hmm. And without going to therapy or having someone, you know, preach it at you, it is taking the audience on a trip of self-examination. Okay. And that is what I love about theater. I think that's a fantastic answer. Mm -hmm. Is there anything within the theater world that you wish you were better at? Choreography. Learning it or creating it? I love what I end up with. I know what I want and I love, and I do, and I do end there. <laughs> but the process of getting there is grueling for me. And granted, I don't think it would be so hard if I was had 10 men and 10 women, but I have, you know, 55 kids. Mm -hmm. A lot of whom do not have any dance training. 
and we do two shows that has a lot of choreography and I don't want it to be crap. Like I want it, I don't ever want it to stop what, you know, now I've pulled you into this story. I don't want it to stop because my choreography is bad. I want my choreography to keep taking you on that story. You know, I don't want rows of kids doing the same stuff, looking like a dance recital. I want it to be interesting and different. I want this group doing something while this group's doing something. And when you're talking about 55 kids, that's hard for me. And I've, I've come up with some tools um, to try to help me do that in my home, you know, planning tools and graphs and <laughs> everything. Um, but really it just gets down to me getting there and working with them and changing things and changing things. And um, it's grueling. It's what I work the hardest at. Yeah. Um, and I wish I was better at the process. Okay. At remembering it and conveying what I want to convey to them and teaching it. And yeah, I wish I was better at that. I would, I would yeah. save a lot of time. It, you said something and it made me really think that I feel like a lot of high school theater directors nowadays are really pushing away from the, the, the that, that old idea of, well, it's a high school show. Right. Where people give it leniency because, well, it's a high school show. You can't expect it to be, you know, which I think a lot of audience members go to shows at high schools and go, well, you know, I'm going to, especially theater people, they, they let that, um, or they put that, uh, that sort of filter up of, you know, this is high school. So don't, and it's great when they, they go, not what I expected. It was fantastic. And I feel like the more theater teachers I know, the more without them saying it, they feel like I don't, I want to move away from the the status quo, so to speak, of what it used to be. I don't because want people they're to capable. Just go, right. Because the kids are more than capable. Mm -hmm. They have energy levels that you know we can only dream about. Yeah. Um, they're 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 sharp. They're bright. They're fast. They absorb like a sponge. They're so capable. Why not? Why not get from them what you can? You know, that level that that they can give to you. It's it's like. And I want them to understand. I mean, a lot of these kids will go on to do theater. Some of them won't. But I want this to be more than just about that. I want, I want them to know what it is to really work at something, mm -hmm. you know, and then be so proud because they worked so hard. And to be doing things on that stage they never thought they could do, you know. Right. So, yeah, I get that. I think that's important. Yeah. Uh, so our final question before the – ending questionnaire do you desire to be known for what you do or who you are and why oh who who i am who i am oh yeah i don't think it matters what anybody do. i mean as far as you know treating people yes but i mean um i don't care what your job is what your hobbies are or how you spend your time who you know what is your light what yeah, how do you affect the people that you cross paths with? Okay. Definitely. All right. And so we will end this interview with the modified version of the questioner created by Bernard Pivot. What is your favorite musical? <laughs> Sunday in the Park with George. What is I your least favorite, favorite musical? Um, I'm not, uh, Grease. <laughs> not a fan? Yeah, I could do without Grease. Okay. <laughs> uh, now I'll ask this. Oh, wait, I you know what I hate too? I, like, along with Grease, like those, you know those musicals that are like Rock of Ages or like, um, like the Queen musical or the Elvis musical or the, you know, those musicals that are just like, built on like some you know what i'm talking about what you mean that they created the vegas, story i call them vegas musicals that the girlfriends drag their boyfriends to because they're like yeah. oh, he'll like this yeah because it's you know 80s music or it's queen yeah. music or it when they just write that really crabby kind of loosely tied together story just to yeah i mean i guess if i just looked at it as a concert 
yeah. for something and stopped expecting it to be a piece of theater, then I would. Do you feel different if the, if the story is really strong? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I'll ask these two questions. Now I know you've been, most of your career has been more centered around musicals. Do you have a favorite play? Not really. Okay. I that one's always it. iffy on I've only before. ever been in one play my whole life. Really? Yeah. What was that? It was called um, What I Did Last Summer. Okay. I was a teenager when I was in that. All right. Uh, so then we will move on to what is your favorite word? Favorite W O R D? Word. In the English language, my favorite word. It's your favorite word. <laughs> Is this how these questions are going to be? That that's these are directly from inside the actor's studio. That is the oddest question. Do you have a word that you just love hearing or makes you smile when someone says it? Um. Oh. Okay, so it's going to have to be mom. Okay. <laughs> because I like hearing myself called mom. All right. <laughs> Do you have a least favorite word? Um, no. Okay. Um, hate. I don't like the word hate. All right. I always think there's a better description for how you're feeling than just saying hate. Okay. Well, just be prepared. That word's coming up in one of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? I love uh, J.S. Bach. Okay. Played by a capable symphony. What sound or noise do you, that word you don't like? Um, when you're stopped at a stoplight and the person behind you has that bass, like that mega bass. Oh, okay. It hurts like the inner, like my eardrums. But okay. I have to, it hurts my head. I feel like my head's going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what profession, and we'll include you uh, as an actress, as a director, and your everyday job in this, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I had always wished that I had studied photography. Okay. What I think I would, would have you? been oh. a real, I think I would have been a really good photographer if I had trained. Okay. And my, my grandfather was a photographer and I wish he would have taught me, but I was kind of young, but yeah, I would, that's something I would take classes on and try to get way better at. See, I think you could also do, um, uh, a, uh, Oh, it just right out of my head as, as I went to go say it. A, a host of like a cooking show. The few videos you put out <laughs> of you doing cooking stuff were but very... I steal everything. Everything's stolen. But <laughs> who, who isn't, you know, in cooking shows not stealing someone's recipe and doing something with it? So. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, is there a profession you would not like to do? Um, anything involving sports? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'd hate to be a lawyer. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and the final, final question. If an afterlife exists, what would you and like to hear? Say? I said, and it does. Go on. <laughs> Not for everybody, but if an afterlife exists, what would you like to hear when you get there? Just the greetings of all my loved ones. Just the joyous greetings of, hey, you know, you did it. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. All right. Well, thank you for joining me for this week's interview. Thank you, Tyler. I, I hope you had some, some fun even with some of the questions that made you think. It was fun. It was uh, and I, I hope everyone else enjoys it. I hope you enjoyed some of Gina's insights. 
uh, and everybody stay safe out there. Yes. Thank you, Tyler. We'll be back again next week. Bye.